Hello and welcome back to PC Retro Tech. Well, in the past few videos on the channel, we've been looking at the Tandy 1000 and various programming topics, but it's time, isn't it, that we got back to our study of the Socket 3 486 motherboards. If you're new to the channel, I had the idea to go out and buy some late 486 boards, each with a different chipset, but all sporting an early PCI implementation. And we've been pushing these to the absolute max with our AMD 5x86 chip with a Pentium 75 rating. It normally runs at 133 MHz, but we've been overclocking this to get the highest possible Quake score. And our record so far on the channel is 16.8 frames per second on camera. We started with the VIA VT-A2C505 chipset, and we had some problems with memory timings being clocked back whenever we tried to overclock the board. But it does have a Visa Local Bus and a PCI implementation on the same main board, so that allowed us to do a direct comparison between the two. Then we looked at this UMC UM8886F chipset, and this board actually was missing the 3.3 volt regulator we need to run our AMD chip. So we had to install one of these before we could get it up and running. And then we looked at this SIS 85C497 and 496 chipset, and this board actually had incorrect jumper settings in the manual. Once we sorted all that out, we're able to overclock the board and finally get a decent time out of it. But there's two boards left. There's one with an ALI chipset, which I want to look at in today's video. And as a special surprise, I have this high-end Intel chipset board to look at in a later video. So let's get stuck in and see just how far we can push these beasts. Well, this board is based on the ALI M1489 and 1487 chipset, which I've heard good things about. But the other reason I've left this board till later is the case sockets. It's got eight of the large ones, which means that I should be able to plug in my 512K of cache instead of the 256K that we're normally working with, plus Tagram, of course. Now, it's got a voltage regulator on board, which means we should be able to run our AMD 5x86 chip and it has onboard I.O., but I'm not sure yet whether it has fast page or Edo memory support. But we're going to find that out when we look up the motherboard manual. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this is probably a DX3000A board. Uh, so let's see if we can find a manual for this thing. Well, I did come across an Amptron DX3000 board, but it's just a completely different motherboard. So I went to Ultimate Hardware 2019 and they have this PC Chips M918 board which really looks the part. Now, the only differences I can see are the DX3000A sticker that I have and this CE sticker which I don't. So if you go to the bottom of the page it says that it's cloned as Amptron DX9300A and check out the cache layout here. That's the same as my board but if I go to this one uh, it's a different layout. Now I think the jumper settings are going to be the same. It looks like the same layout and if I go back to the PC chips one there is a jumper manual but it just takes me to the Amtron 9300A uh, manual with the alternate cache layout. Still it gives us hope that Edo might be supported. Uh, it looks like we're going to have a 40 megahertz front side bus and if I go back to the main page here, it tells us that the chipset is the Finale 486 PCI chipset. So I wonder if this will be the 486 chipset to end all 486 chipsets. Well, I've gone ahead and plugged everything in, and it is getting exciting. The motherboard manual mentions settings for 512K of cache for the first time of any board we've tried on the channel. It also has a 50 MHz frontside bus option, which will be great for overclocking. And uh, although it doesn't mention the AMD 5x86 chip per se, uh, I've just got an Intel DX4100 in at the moment anyway, just for testing purposes. Now I put my Senglabs ET6000 video card in, uh, since that's the best one that we've found so far for PCI. And uh, of course I've got a stick of Edo RAM in there. So let's turn it on and see whether this board even works. So lights on the keyboard, uh, fan is spinning, uh, nothing on the monitor yet. And uh, that's the sound I want to hear. Great, so it sounds like it's working, although I'm not getting a picture on the screen at this point. I think that's probably to do with the way I set my monitor up. So let me just sort that out 
and then we'll check out the BIOS in this thing. Well, these monitors apparently work better if you plug the VGA cable in, who knew? Anyway, I have a floppy and hard drive connected now and I am able to get into the BIOS, which is good news. Uh, so I'll set up a floppy drive, just a 1.44, and we'll see if it'll detect the hard drive. Uh, very often I find with this particular drive that it's detected incorrectly. And uh, those settings don't look right to me, so uh, we'll accept them anyway, but I suspect it's not going to boot uh, with those. Uh, let's look at the advanced setup. Uh, don't see anything terribly exciting in there. All looks fairly standard, actually. Uh, let's go to the chipset settings. Ah, yeah, so here we have auto config. If we turn that off, it looks like we're going to get DRAM and cache timings to play with. Uh, looks nice and simple to set up as well. Hidden refresh. Uh, the write buffer looks interesting. Uh, certainly want to try that out. And uh, the rest of it looks a little bit more standard. So a few settings there to play with. So what I'm going to do now is reboot the machine and see whether it will actually detect that drive correctly. Uh, I've tried it on quite a few systems and very few of them detect this drive correctly. I've no idea why that is. And uh, the other thing that I noticed when I booted this earlier is that it said the cache was 256K, which shouldn't be the case. And yeah, there we go, the hard drive controller failure. So I will set that up according to the numbers that are actually on the drive itself and hopefully we can boot this thing. Well, I got the hard drive supported correctly now, so it detects that, and then on this screen, shows that it detects the CPU correctly, even the Edo RAM, but unfortunately it's still only showing 256K of cache, and moreover, it just completely hangs at this point. So unfortunately, it looks like it really doesn't support that 512K of cache. I'm pretty sure I have the settings correct. So I'm probably gonna have to wind that back to 256K to even get this board to boot which is a bit disappointing, but at least we can still try this board out and see what its performance is like compared to the other boards. Well, I've once again had no luck getting 512K of cache working on a 486 motherboard. Man, what is it with these cache chips? I've got two different brands here. Maybe they're just not cooperating with one another or something. Anyway, I went through a bunch of different jumper settings, and I think it's actually clear from the settings in the manual that one of the jumper settings is for the amount of cache and another one is for whether it's one or two banks and so on. So I think the settings were correct. Uh, it just wasn't working. So I went back to 256K of cache and at least that's actually working. At least the machine doesn't hang. Uh, so I'm running a Quake time demo here and uh, I've just got the standard DX4100 in it, the Intel one. And I don't remember what score we used to get with this, but it's around 10 frames a second, I think, with the standard BIOS settings. Uh, so let's see what we get here. Wait a minute, what's going on here? Uh, we've got 11.1. That seems pretty high for a DX4100. Well, I'll take it. <laughs> I think it's time we get the 5X86 in this thing and start cranking up the front side bus. Uh, this is looking pretty good so far. Well, I finally managed to get this CPU set up so that it's both four times multiplier, so it'll give us 133 megahertz internally, and so that the internal L1 cache, or cache if you prefer that pronunciation, is in write back mode. Now, that was actually the tricky one. So at first, I went looking for the write back pin and found a jumper where that was connected. Uh, but unfortunately, there was no way to connect that to 3.5 volts that I could see. So I connected it directly with a cable at first, and this just didn't work. So in the end, uh, what did work was to set it up as an Intel Writeback Enhanced 486DX266, also known as the P24D, and then go hunting around for the clock multiplier pin, uh, which also breaks out on the jumpers. And once I put a jumper on there, then everything worked perfectly. So now we're able to run another Quake benchmark and see if we get higher scores now that the thing is set up with an AMD 5X86 running at its normal 133 MHz. Well, being 33% faster, we'd probably expect something like 14 frames per second, but it never seems to go quite that quickly. That's not too bad, 13.3, it looks alright. 
Uh, so I'm going to fiddle around with some of the memory and cache timings as well and just see what we can get while we have it at 133 MHz. Well, it turns out that the only memory or cache timing that wasn't already on the fastest setting was this one here for the cache. So I'll set that down to 2111 and that should speed things up if it works. And I guess that explains why our DX4100 was going so fast. Now I did already try the byte merge and fast back to back and they just slow things down so I'll leave those off. And actually I tried turning this CPU to PCI write buffer off entirely and actually that slowed things down as well. So I think we actually have the fastest possible settings in the BIOS here. So let's see if they actually run. And yeah, that worked without any problems at all. We got 13.9 frames per second, which is not bad for stock frequencies for the AMD 5X86. So, well, it's time to crank up that front side bus speed. So first of all, I'll try and get everything stable at 40 megahertz and we'll see if we can get anywhere near our record. Well, I managed to get a 15.9, which is a long way from our channel record of 16.8. So this is 40 megahertz front side bus, which with the four times multiplier means 160 megahertz. But I've had to clock the cache timings back to 3111 instead of 2111. So what I'm gonna do is fiddle with some more settings here and see if I can get that back up to the higher speed, maybe by dropping the memory or something like that, and see if we can get a little bit better timing here. Well, it looks like that cache timing of 3111 is actually essential. If I go back to 2111, it doesn't matter what else I change, uh, it just hangs. So uh, what I've done here is switch over to 150 megahertz. So I now have 50 megahertz front side bus and multiplier of three. And as you can see, frustratingly, it's still 15.9 frames per second. Uh, I had to actually knock a few of the memory timings back to get this. So yeah, frustrating that we can't even get into the 16 frames a second territory. Well, I think that's gonna be it, guys. I've tried everything I can think of to get more out of this board, and 15.9 seems to be the max. I had high hopes for this board, uh, especially with that 512K cache option, but that didn't work, and as you saw, uh, the cache timings weren't brilliant either. But I guess that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Anyway, that's all I have time for this week. Uh, so if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you in a later video. Bye.